So my name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you so much, Eddie. Uh, I'm joined by my friends and fellow staffers, Eddie Martinez and Breno Tanan. So you can give it up for them. Say hello. <laughs> Poor Breno. Uh, we're not giving him a single break today at all. Uh, he was here before I was at like 545, setting up 6 a.m. prayer. He went through rehearsal. He then like played and then ran off and then's doing this. And he's just going to do that on repeat a few times. So someone said that I looked pissed in the first panel because I was like, <laughs> so that's, a, that's just the look of a, yeah, that's just tired. Man. Um, anyway, so uh, we're jumping into his uh, emphasis on prayer as a church. Prayer isn't a new concept for us as a church. And I don't think it's a new concept for us as individuals, which we'll talk about in just a second. But um, we're jumping into this season of just saying, was anybody here for increase nights? I know there was a quite, okay, awesome. So increase nights were so good because we just postured ourselves in a position of saying, Lord, whatever you want to do over this season as our church, we say yes. Before you even tell us what that is, we're going to kind of place our yes in front of you and whatever you ask, that's the answer. So Lord, we're, it's all about you. And that's really the posture we're taking at this point uh, as a church, just going through this uh, season of prayer. And so what we're going to do for the next four weeks is really unpack something that we call the Lord's Prayer, and some of you from a Catholic tradition may call it Our Father. And I just want to give you a quick thing as well. Um, two kind of companion books that have been guiding our time, my time, um, has been these two. This is a book, it's called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools by Tyler Stanton. This is a book that Eddie and uh, Chris Chang read like over a year ago, and they just kept talking about, and I put it off and put it off. And then Will Schimpf read it, and he was just like, it's one of those books that you can't just rip through you read it, then you have to put it down and do something. I love books like that because it challenges me. This has been phenomenal. And then um, for everybody who is in a group, which is all of you, right? Um, this is, we're going through practicing the way, the practice of prayer. This is a free digital download, or you can pay $10 on Amazon. But it's so good because it has these practical tools that we'll kind of be talking through as we jump in to this idea of prayer. And I love talking about prayer because it's such a unique topic for all of us because no matter who we are, Prayer is not foreign to us. Like, even if you don't believe in this, like, Jesus thing yet or the God of the Old and New Testament, prayer is not foreign from any, like, I, I've known atheists and agnostics who the moment they get that diagnosis, all of a sudden they're reaching out to someone somewhere outside of themselves. Anybody ever been there? You don't really know what you're praying to. You don't even know if you're doing it right, but you're like, there's got to be something else out there. And according to the best research we have, more Americans claim to pray this week, more Americans will pray this week than will go to work, drive a car, exercise, or have sex. That's over half of the population in America. That's more people than attend church. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Prayer seems to be this instinctive part of human nature to reach out and acknowledge something greater than ourselves. But many of us, if we're honest, we have kind of an odd relationship with prayer, some of us, because we have all these thoughts about like, is there anybody on the other side of that phone call? Right. Is there anybody on the other end? What does prayer do? How does it work? Does it work at all? And for those of us who have a rhythm of prayer of some kind, we, we're like, we're afraid we're doing it wrong. Or maybe we're not doing it enough. Or maybe our motives aren't very good. We're like, oh man, is that God hearing me? Did I not ask it right? It says the prayer of the righteous. Am I not righteous? No, Jesus gave me his righteousness, but maybe I worded it wrong. Right. We just have these weird tensions sometimes in our relationship with Lord through prayer. And think if, if you've ever asked any of these things. Many of us have asked questions like, is prayer really necessary? Is God all-powerful? And if he is all-powerful, that means he accomplishes what he wants when he wants, right? So then why the heck did I have to ask? Have you ever thought something like this? Why does God sometimes seem to answer prayers, but only after a really long period of time? If the answer was yes, why the heck did he make me sweat it out? What is actually happening when I pray? Do my prayers matter in the real world? And for those of us who even have a rhythm of prayer, for so many of us, like, like me for years and years, we kind of only get in the water knee deep of prayer in relationship with God. And we're like, the water feels fine. It's all good. Like, it's all good. I, I'm, and we neglect swimming in this like vast expanse of unity and communion with the Father that Jesus gave his life so that we could have. Many of us have stopped in only that knee-deep water. And for some of us, we just need to be freed in this room and hear that there are times in my own life, and there are times I'm sure with many of you, that you find God admirable and worthy of something, but if you're honest, you find him boring. 
Or many of you, it, you find it hard to take prayer seriously because it feels like you're just doing it out of obligation. Or maybe it's just confusing to you altogether, or maybe some combo of those two things. And so when we hit that, what should we do? And the answer is we go to the source, right? We're going to take it from the mouth of Jesus where he teaches his followers how we ought to pray. And the great thing about the Lord's Prayer is that there's some of us in here that could just recite it. If I started it, a lot of you in this room could just finish it, right? Football teams do it. There are some homes that do it. Like, you just grew up knowing it. And, and sometimes that's okay, but sometimes we can just breeze by it out of just rote memory and not think a darn thing about it. And for others of us, this is going to be brand new for you. But either way, there's going to be an enormous benefit to our church as over the next few weeks, we just unpack what Jesus is teaching about how we ought to pray. And just to give a personal illustration, I grew up in a home where it was kind of taught that pre-made prayers are sort of the starter kit. Like the Lord's Prayer is like a starter kit. And then once you kind of like understand that, you sort of move on and do your own thing. You build your own prayer life. And I do get what that is, but I, I don't think that's doing enough of a service to how Jesus taught us to pray. And my life has been dramatically changed. My time with the Lord has been dramatically changed over the last few weeks as I have gone back to and begun praying through the Lord's Prayer and all that it means. So this is where we're going to head. I'm going to read it for us. And then we're just going to jump in and talk about what in the heck it means for Jesus to tell us to pray to our Father who is in heaven and his name is hallowed. So if you want to join me in Matthew chapter 6, you can. You can do it with a physical copy. If you got your phone, that's awesome. If you have neither one of those things or desire just to stare up at the screen, uh, a word uh, from the Lord will be provided to you. All right? So verse 9, chapter 6, Jesus says this. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And all we're going to attack today is this first line where he says, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And the reason these two guys are up here is, is we were kind of prepping, as I was kind of prepping to even think through this, this sermon, um, I like to bring people into that conversation and just let them poke holes and process. And our conversation was so helpful and so fruitful for me personally that I was like, man, I could get up here for 30 minutes and give you all the scriptures about how God is your father and he is so holy and he should be revered. And I was like, man, at some point, we just need to talk about the day-to-day -day implications of what the heck that means. And this conversation was so unbelievably helpful to my own time with the Lord that I, we just kind of brought it here. So I'm just going to ask a couple questions and let these guys uh, just kind of speak the wisdom that the Lord has given them, not only from his word, but just in practiced time with the Lord. So the first question we're going to jump into is if Jesus could have started the Lord's Prayer with anything, he, can, he is the sovereign creator of the universe. He can start it however he wants. Why does he start this prayer with our Father? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's interesting, right? Because it's a, it's, you see in Luke, right, the, um, the disciples are like, hey, how do we pray? And this is how Jesus answers. And it's a fascinating question because they have all this context for prayer and for a holy God, right? We see it now as the Old Testament, but they have story after story about their people being uh, told how separate they are from a holy God. And they have all these miracles, and, and that's what makes God good, right? They're delivered from slavery. There's a burning bush, and Moses is told, take his shoes off because his ground is holy. There's, um, there, there's like a river that splits, right? There's like all these stories that they're being told. There's Isaiah and the burning coal, and there, there's just all this stuff that gives them context for God is holy, right. right? Respect him. Respect him. And they have entire rituals set up to cleanse themselves before they can even enter into his presence. And Jesus begins and he says, our father. And it's interesting because it's not the first time the term father is used in reference to God. But that in the Old Testament is like respect. And Jesus here, he says, Abba, it's like dad. Like the way that a toddler would approach a loving dad. Like daddy. And so what Jesus begins with is relationship. 
And so he's like, you have to begin. The, the beginning of this and the purpose of this is to extend relationship and to understand that this holy God that you know loves you and is good and wants to relate to you in a way that a father wants to relate to their child with love and understanding, receiving you in all of your ugliness and all of your tainted, broken sinfulness. And he's like, I just want to extend my love to you. And that's where we begin in prayer. Yeah, it starts like the whole, the whole prayer is put in perspective by that line, our father. Um, John Mark Comer, uh, he, he was teaching on this and he used an illustration about coming home and his kids just run to the door to see him. And I can relate with that. I have three young girls, nine, five, and two. And when I come home, it's like a mad dash to the door. They're screaming. There's gnashing of teeth. There's like, uh, it's just, they're sprinting to the door. Generally, my youngest gets there first, just screaming, dad. And I have a backpack and a bunch of other stuff. And I'm trying to set everything down while also picking them up because they're jumping into my arms. And they are just without reservation, jumping into telling me all the things. I'm hearing about how the Judah dance went. I'm hearing about how like their day at school was. I'm hearing that one of them wants chippies. I'm hearing that one of them is like, can I have ice cream? Hey, can you come read with me? Hey, can you come get on the floor and play princesses? Hey, can you do such and such? Hey, can you tell mom this? And they are just, it's all three of them at the same time. And, and the reason for that, I'm an imperfect father, but the image is the reason for that is they know my posture toward them is welcoming and loving. They don't have to worry about their motive. They don't have to get their words right. Some of their, sometimes they're asking me for chippies because Deshea said no, and they're hoping I'll give a yes. It'll cause some riff for us that ends with them getting chippies. And so they're just like letting me have it. And they know that I love them. I accept them. And even in all their crazy motives and even all of their insane requests, I'm open to them and loving how much more so a perfect father. And that's what puts the rest of this prayer in perspective is we're not coming to a tyrant. We're coming to someone whose posture toward us is welcoming and loving like you're running to the door to greet dad, a good loving father. And you're just opening up about your wants, your loves, your desires. You want to get in the floor and play together. I mean, you can take that terminology so far, just that relational openness when we talk about our father. Uh, yeah, just one thing. Uh, recently, I started uh, being more in intentional about calling God father. Uh, I, as I was reading and as I'm going through the Lord's Prayer, one thing that I spotted was there's a lot of uh, baggage there uh, for all of us. And, and Eddie talked a little bit about that. But, like, when you call God mm. father, there is bias there, you know, because, you know, maybe you had a great father, still imperfect, uh, maybe you don't even know your father, right? So there's this whole spectrum of relationship uh, dynamics that you can maybe uh, have had with your father, earthly father, that kind of like unconsciously you frame your relationship with God through that. And um, I caught myself doing that. So I, I, I always went, you know, to pray and I was like, Lord, and, which is not wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying in my personal life, I've been trying to be more intentional about anchoring myself in my in my identity as his son more than like oh yeah he's out there somewhere he is great but like he is you know like he's there and i'm here so anyways um that's kind of like something that really hit me as i was reading the first line our father so um just let me encourage you on that like god is not your earthly father he is uh he wants to reveal that to you so yeah, so it's great to talk about how that goes well and like you should just believe it and he's your father and it's so easy. But one thing we want to wrestle with or talk through is where have you gotten this wrong in your own prayer life? How has that affected you in your own personal life when that understanding of him as father has not been right? Um, yeah, I think uh, alluding to a little bit what, of what Breno said, for me, it was not allowing God to define that environment for himself. And so what I mean by that is that bias that you're talking about, right? Like whether you, you have an, a relational experiential bias with fatherhood, right. you do. Whether you don't know your dad, you think your dad's the greatest person in the world, or you're somewhere in between the two, there's a bias that you enter into. And it's because our relationship with God, I mean, our relationship with our earthly father is tainted by sin. Even the most, the best 
like possible example of fatherhood that exists on earth is tainted by sin somehow. And so for me, when I entered into that space, I was a little bit less on one side of the scale than the other with my relationship with my dad. And what I brought into that I didn't realize was um, I'm going to get everything I could possibly get right before I get into this space. And then when I get into this space, I'm going to show you how good my report card was so you can tap me on the back and let me go about my day. And, and what God was challenging me in over years and years and years was showing me, like, I want to see the F. Like, I want you to bring to me the worst possible parts of who you are. Not because I need to know them. I already do. So bring them to me so that I can work on them. But I had so much baggage in what that looked like. That horrified me. Mm. Right? And so for me, it was like, how could I possibly respect God if I don't bring my best possible self into a moment in communication with him. And what that did was that didn't reflect relationship. It became more of like this executive meeting of like, tell me how I can get better and I'm going to go work really hard on getting better and then come back and tell me how I've done and then I'm going to keep going. And instead of coming to God, like my life is yours. Like even what I think I'm getting an F in, you're not even thinking about at this moment, right? And so this is your time to work on me however you need me to work on in my heart is completely yours. You sanctify me how you want to. You change my life however you want to do it, and you focus on the things that you think I need to be focused on right now instead of me trying to tell you how this is all going to go down and how you're just going to help me do it. Yeah, it's that day-to-day interaction. We were talking um, in the back, and I was like, you know, every, like we talk about like a walk with the Lord. You know, you hear that terminology a lot. If you trust in Jesus, every step you take is your walk with the Lord, whatever that means, right? He is... He's with us, he's to, and he wants to be acknowledged as that we are together in that moment. That's right. The goal of this whole time as a church isn't to become like the best prayers we possibly can. It's for us to learn a tool better the way that Jesus desires it so that we can better connect in, be unified to, abide with the God who knows every single thing about us and loves us unconditionally. And so to see him as father, to see him as loving, to see his posture as good toward us, it changes the way that you want to interact with him. And there's a level at which, like, again, every step you take is your walk with the Lord. And it's not about just putting him in an executive meeting box. It's about opening it up. And I stunk at that for years and years and years. I felt like I had to kind of do the same thing. Like, I, I, I try to hide my Fs from everybody, right? Like, I, like, I tried to hide my Fs from my wife. I definitely tried to do that with the Lord where you're like, I don't want you to see the worst parts of me. So I'm like trying to formulate all my stuff and be like, all right, I just like, I got to get all my stuff good so the Lord can like listen to a righteous man. Like, cause I just can hide it. And it was the realization when I just came to him and I was like, hey, this meeting is coming up, Lord. And I'm like frustrated by this meeting and I'm irritated at this person and I'd like to push them out of a moving vehicle. And I don't know what to do with those feelings, you know, like, I just need you to meet me in that moment. It's me coming to the Lord and being like, this is confusing to me. And the fact that I don't have it all together and I'm not in control of it is infuriating. And I want to hand that to you, but I'm not sure at this point what to do with those feelings. There was so much freedom in that because that's when I began to understand what Jesus means when his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Because for years, it didn't feel light. It felt super heavy because I was trying to shoulder the load of my own sin, my own shame, all of those like, Nah, you don't want that, Lord. Like, you just want the best representation of me. And it wasn't until I just came realized, oh, you actually want relationship with me. And your insane design of your good news, you want, like, me. And everything changed in my prayer life from that point on to just realize, like, again, every step I take is a moment to walk with the Lord and be in union with him. You had a story about that where God was doing something crazy in you when you were going to the tattoo That's uh, place. Yes, yeah, so... Um, you know, recently I got a new tattoo, which I'm very pumped about. You don't have to clap for that. It's, I, I, I put the pause there, but it's fine. Uh, but I was listening to this book, uh, and he was talking about this father-son relationship and about choosing or preferring to spend time with God, right? And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then a thought came to my mind because I was like heading to the tattoo place, and I'm all pumped about it. And then I said, well, I never, I never really talked about this with my father, you know, and I want to talk to him. And I'm driving in the car, and I just 
kind of like, I just said it out loud. I said, God, I'm getting a new tattoo today. And in that moment, for just as stupid as, as that might sound to you, I felt so much love meeting me in that moment right there because it was genuine. You know, when we talk about lacking excitement in our walk with Jesus, because we, you know, we think he's so far removed from our lives. We don't anchor ourselves in our identity as sons and daughters. And we just feel like God's like, no, he's too busy for that. He doesn't care about that stuff. So anyways, it was just a moment where I, I was met with love right there, you know. Just like as times like, I remember one time I was, I, I had this thought in which I said, I'm not going to pray about this thing. God doesn't care about it. Because it was too shallow or whatever. And I remember a story came out of that because God met us there in a miraculous way in which I was like, almost he said, no, I care. I care. I want you to share those things with me. So, And that, and that goes into so much allowing God to define that stuff because that's our attempt to be holy. Right. We're like, I'm going to pick the thing that God cares about and the thing that God doesn't care about based on what I prioritize. Right. And so like... God is God, and he's big, and he's holy, so he doesn't care if I get a good parking spot at Target. Like, he doesn't care. But it's like, who are you to say he doesn't care? Who are you to tell God what he does and doesn't care about? And so when you come to God, like, you define for me what it is that you want me to bring to the table. You tell me how you love me and how you care about me. Then we got we stop coming to God like, here's the holiest thing I could possibly bring to you right now. And instead, just enter into a relationship that's like, this is what's on my mind. Do with that as you wish and bring to this whatever's on yours. Now, how does hallowed be your name play into your prayer life and personal life? Yeah, this is my favorite because we're talking a lot about vulnerability. And for me, I didn't grow up. Vulnerability was um, not good. (laughs) I grew up to survive. And to survive, you don't get vulnerable. You don't let people in. You build walls up. You only let people in strategically um, in in order to benefit yourself. And so all of this stuff that we're talking about requires a vulnerability to say, this is my ugly. This is my unknown. This is, I never play games that I don't think I'm going to win. It's just, you got to know. If I'm playing, there's a possibility I got a chance, right? That's just me. And so entering the prayer and being like, I don't know how to do this is horrifyingly vulnerable. And what holiness does is Jackie Hill Perry has this book, Holier Than Thou, and it has this logical equation. It's like if God is holy, he cannot sin, and most of us stop there. But if he cannot sin, he cannot sin against me. If God can't sin against me, God is officially the safest place to be my ugliest self. Because there's no other relationship that I have anywhere here on earth that can possibly be my ugliest self, and the person has no possibility to sin against me. No possibility to have malicious intent. No possibility to hurt me, right? But God, in his holiness, being completely separate, completely distinct from all of humanity and all of creation, says, I come to you as father, completely holy. Therefore, I cannot sin against you. So I invite you in to be your most vulnerable self. Bring to me the ugly. Bring to me the shame. Bring to me the guilt. Bring to me the hurt. Bring to me the questions. He's not scared of it. He knows exactly what you need. And so for me, it was a switch of, oh, my gosh, survival in this is actually saying, here is all of me, the things that I don't even understand yet, and let you work through all of that, God. And it's, it's crazy how the holiness also, it led me so much to be like, at first it was like, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. And now it's so freeing. To understand, it's like, oh, my gosh, he's holy. I'm good. If he's holy and we have relationship, I'm so safe right now. Yeah, I think uh, the holiness portion kind of like points us to trust, yeah. right? Uh, I, I, there's a quote uh, that uh, Tyler uh, has on his book. It says, Jesus hasn't revealed a God we can perfectly understand, but he has revealed a God we can perfectly trust. And some of us were just like so, like we want we want to grow up and we we lose that innocence and that pu- the purity of you know like just a child that doesn't know much but is just excited excited mm. to be there and there's so much trust in that relationship that you know uh, everything goes in there you know uh, and literally everything goes knowing that God is 
holy and cannot sin against us provides this safe space and leads us to worship, right? Like as he reveals his holiness to us in this relationship, I mean, I can't help but worship him, right? And this this posture of like, hallowed be your name, right? Like, like lifting his name up is also kind of like an outcome of that. Yeah, and I think uh, in Job, we see this done beautifully. I remember when I was mm-hmm. probably in high school, um, I randomly remembered this. So I was having this conversation. I was, ha- I was at dinner with uh, my mom my, and my dad. And um, something must have happened that was funny with my mom early in the day. And I went to go share this story. And there was, just, there was this way that I talked in high school that I'm very embarrassed about. But, like, I, point, I remember pointing to my mom and being, like, telling my dad, like, yeah, can you believe this chick? Blah, 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 blah. And, yeah, exactly. And so my dad's like sitting across from the booth and he looks at me and he's like, that's your mother. You don't talk to her like that. She's not a friend. And there's this understanding of the holiness of God. That's like, there is a line. That's right. He's completely separate. Like there, he is a holy God. We're not dismissing that in any way. That's right. But like in Job, you see like Job's life is completely falling apart. And he's like, God, what the, I haven't done anything to deserve this. What's going on? And there's somehow there's this line that gets crossed in his heart and God sits him down and is like, let me tell you who I am because you weren't there. And in, but instead of, we see that as like this discipline, mm. but what, what we don't get is like in that moment, he could just lift all the rules and be like, all right, enemy, you take Job out. We're done. Right. 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 He's completely crossed the line. We're over. And instead he sits him down like a loving father and begins to instruct him. There's boundaries here that you're going to respect, but I'm lovingly going to walk you through those boundaries by telling you I'm completely different from you and from your friends and from your dad and from everything, and I'm going to do this in love. And then he goes on to restore everything, which is this beautiful understanding of like, yeah, I'm a father. I am a father. I'm going to have tough conversations with you. There is going to be discipline that is had. It's going to get rough at times. There's going to be tension, but in love, I will walk with you through that if you come to me honestly and allow it to happen. That's right. Well, and that's the message of the gospel and ultimately the message of the Bible is, like, I had this thought, I don't know if it was like this week or last week, but I had this crazy thought where it was like talking about, like, God as holy and what that means for me, because that's, that's the hardest one for me, because when I come to prayer with the Lord, sometimes I hallow a lot of things in my heart, you know what I'm saying? And, and he, he's one of them. But as I've been praying through this, I'm like, Lord, I, you need to be the only thing that I set apart as revered in this way. But I come to the Lord with so many things. And so as I've been praying through the Lord's prayer, I've just been stopping there and saying, all right, all these other things that I revere, let me lay them down. Like this, this, this. Like, and I'm just handing them to the Lord to make sure that he's the only one who has that rightful place. But again, if you lean too much on the, holiest, the holiness side you don't see the message of the Bible, which is like, you remember in um, Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve sin, and they're banished from the garden, right? This perfect communion walk together thing that God had with them. He's like, we can't do that anymore. And we remember the banishment, but what we forget is that God doesn't leave his presence back in Eden. He goes with them, Right. right? And then you see when Jesus comes, the angel says, you will call him Emmanuel, God with us. And that's something that we celebrate at at Christmas, but we forget all the other months of the year, that that wasn't just to speak on this guy that will live for 33 some odd years, die, be raised to life, and then just bounce out of here. That was a promise that what is being done through this one, Jesus, that you will call Emmanuel, will make possible that God will dwell with his people forever. Fast forward all the way to the end of Revelation. If you look, I, I don't remember if it's in the last chapter or the chapter before, but they see the new heaven and the new earth coming down, this new Jerusalem. And the promise that gets proclaimed from that is they go, hey, and God is coming down to dwell with his people. They will be his people. He will be their God and he will dwell with them forever. The idea of God's holiness is he goes, man, when we sin, when we mess it up, yes, there's separation, but he bridges that gap through his son, Jesus, so that we might be one with him in connection and communion. And that's what bridges that holiness and that fatherly love that comes hand in hand. And here's, here's the thing, the big takeaway that I want for, for all of us here. Tyler Stanton in his book, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, he uses this illustration and it's so good. 
he talks about how all of us are kind of in this restaurant. And we're, we're, we're reading the menu at the restaurant. We are hearing the server talk about all the wonderful food. The server's telling us about the wonderful nightly specials. We're even seeing all of the food go by. We're kind of smelling it, looking at it. But he's like, you don't know how good that food is until you pick up a fork and eat it. And he said, this is how it is so often in our relationship with the Lord. We just show up to church if we're not careful. We learn a lot of things. We read the menu. We read God's word. We hear a pastor, a preacher, a friend talk about God's word and how good he is and how wonderful he is. And you're going to love it. And it's so amazing. And you watch as other people kind of partake of it. But at some point, we all have to pick up a fork relationship with God is not something to merely be known. It is something to be experienced. And my challenge to each of us this week, like starting tomorrow, is pick up a fork. I challenge everyone in this room to create or increase a habit of daily prayer. And before I tell you what that challenge is going to be, I'm going to name it for you. But before I tell you, I want to give you five things to think about before I give you this challenge. Number one, start small. Start small, right? If you don't pray at all, don't be like, I'm going to lock myself in a room for two hours and we're hashing this out. (laughs) You're going to hate it before it even begins. Like, if you don't pray at all, five minutes is good, you know? Number two, think subtraction, not addition. To follow Jesus is not to add more things onto your already insanely overloaded life. To practice prayer and follow Jesus If that's what we truly prioritize, other things are going to have to come out to make room for what matters most. Number three, you get out what you put in. Number four, experts talk about a J curve. You're going to feel substantially worse at something before you feel dramatically better at whatever it is. Tomorrow, when you start this habit, you may feel like you are fumbling all over yourself. All good. Show up the next day all good, show up the next day, right? It's, again, we're not trying to be perfect prayers. We're trying to increase our relationship with a holy God who is acting as father and loving and wants to know us and be connected. That's what Jesus prays for his disciples in John 17. He said, Lord, make them one with you as we are one. He desires that oneness. All right, last thing, there is no spiritual formation without repetition. We got to keep at it. We got to try the Lord in this and see how it works. So here is my challenge to everyone here. I'm asking for 21 days. Commit to five minutes of prayer before you unlock your phone in the morning. I say unlock and set a touch because my my phone is my alarm and I don't want to give you something I'm not going to do. So I will touch my phone. So like just before you unlock it, you know what I'm talking about. You start your day, many of you, you start your day with that scroll. You start your day with that open. I'm saying, can everyone in here commit to 21 days of five minutes of prayer before you unlock your phone? If you want to level up, if you really want to go to a new place, look, I'll meet you here for the next 20 days right here at 6 a.m., for prayer. You want to take a massive next step, like let's join together for an hour. Let's pray together for the next 20 days, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. right here in this room, Monday through Sunday and on repeat. But all I'm asking right now is five minutes before you unlock your phone. And so some of you are going to have the question, well, what the heck do I do when I get there? Right? If this is brand new for you, even if it's not brand new for you, hear me out. Maybe this is a time for you to just pray through the Lord's prayer again stopping and taking it in, not just ripping through it as fast as you can to say you did your thing, but to really say, our Father who is in heaven, and then wrestle with, do you see him as Father? What does that mean for you? How does that change today? Hallowed be your name. Like me, is there anything else that you revere in your heart as hallowed? Lay that at the feet of Jesus and be like, I surrender that. I surrender that. You are all I want to revere. And then you get to go on to, to huge statements like, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Or for those of you who say like, you know, the Lord's prayer is fine. I've kind of moved off that. Great. Like pray through Psalm 5. That's what I've been doing in my, in my time with the Lord too. Psalm 5. 
Psalm 19, Psalm 20, Psalm 23. You just pick up something and, and, and read through it. Maybe that'll set you free. The social media team and, and the communications team as a whole is providing every day over these 21 days. I got an email in my inbox this morning about something to focus on today and pray through. If all the other stuff, you're like, I don't even know where to start. Like, great, start there. We provide that for you. And then some of you go, I, I, I still, I, five minutes seems like an eternity. Then here's what I would challenge you. Maybe the first two minutes, you just sit there, hands open, and you just say, Lord, I'm here. I don't even know what that means, but Lord, I'm here. And I think that'll set you free because a lot of times we think prayer is about all of our talking, but if it truly is a relationship, there's a communication that's happening. And so we should probably talk about as much as we listen or maybe listen more than we talk. Don't be afraid of the space. God will speak. God will answer. God will reveal. And I just want to say this at at the very end of it. I just want to remind us all, the goal is not to leave here and say, netcast, we became better prayers. Yay us. We get our prayer certificate at the end. We can put it on the wall. We did our thing on to the next. The reason we're pressing into prayer is because there is a living God who sees us in all of our sin and shame and guilt. And instead of standing at a distance because of his holiness, he leaned in and allowed holiness to be crucified in our place through Jesus Christ, who was raised to life on the third day so that we could have this relationship made available to us that we might seek him and walk every day with him by trusting in Jesus, turning from our sin and following his way, and his teaching. We want as a church to increase our relationship with God so that we would see every moment as an opportunity to walk shoulder to shoulder with the living God until one day God calls us home and we see him face to face and we celebrate the mess out of him with each other for all eternity. And right now, even as we jump into communion, you guys can go ahead and prep that. Communion, the whole idea of communion is to celebrate and the relationship, the communion that was given to us by Jesus Christ, this insane reality that we can have relationship with God through the, through the given body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. If you don't believe in all that, don't take this. This is silly. But for those of us who do believe in this message of hope, this is life to us. There is a true living God who knows me completely and loves me totally. And in some crazy world, he wants to know about my tattoo. (laughs) So what we're going to do right now is stand. We'll start in the back, exit out your right, come down, take the bread, dip it in the juice. We'll worship together. And 